say that one of the interesting things is that you give a model to compute, to extend the Floer complex to a class of Poisson manifolds. This looks like quite interesting for the Poisson community. And uh, let's say, so the second uh, driving question is, can you find, can you define, can you extend the Floer complex to those from symplectic to singular symplectic? And uh, these are the two driving questions that took us here. And let's say the, 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 the way to, to approach these questions, I mean, there are two ways, the difficult path and the easier path. The difficult path, I think it's very interesting and I will explain it, but we don't have results yet. And the easy path is, uh, is to take out the singularity, right? And, uh, and to pretend the singularity is not there and then put it back somehow. And uh, that point of view, when you take out the singular set, then you have a non-compact symplectic manifold. So let's say it also connects to the previous computations of floor homology of non-compact manifolds. So, okay. And of course, by, I mean, how did I end up here? Because I have always been interested in, in, in dynamical systems and on the connection on geometry and dynamical systems. And this is a good intersection point, in particular about computing periodic order. So about, about the old and new, the old will be that in the way we will recover or some of the classical questions about floor theory for non-compact manifolds. And the new things is that we will extend this uh, also to manifolds with boundary and that this boundary sometimes has a meaning uh, uh, which I will give some examples. Motivation of course, Henri Poincaré, if I didn't spend enough time in France, then I wouldn't uh, project such a sentence. This sentence says, okay, periodic orbits are like the first step into understanding really the dynamics. Well, let's, uh, I mean, let's look a little bit in the general ideas and let's try to look for some inspiration. Of course, when topology met differential geometry, maybe one of the first moments was in Morse theory, when of course the critical points were organized as a Morse uh, homology complex. And we can read like the idea is like what we explain to our students is that we can read the topology from the similarities and then we have more inequalities, et cetera. And this was like an inspirational source for Floer who replaced a function by the action functional with the inspiration that came before from Rabinovich's uh, result who identified indeed the critical points of the action functional. And this is a very easy computation to periodic orbits of, of a system. And this was like a starting point of this whole theory of floor homology. And, uh, and from, from us, it's very important to keep these initial ideas of floor because sometimes instead of using sophisticated techniques, uh, we, we really go back to the initial definitions and it's quite worthwhile. Though I, I will be glad to, if you give me in, like new ideas because uh, what happens is that I don't come from this uh, floor uh, group so I'm learning, let's say, that's true. Okay, so two guiding conjectures already for the theory, for the non-singular theory were Weinstein conjecture, which uh, conjectures that the red vector field of a contact compact manifold has at least a periodic orbit. This was proved in dimension three. And the other one is like, on the other side is Arnold's conjecture that uh, given a T-dependent Hamiltonian, uh, it connects the number of uh, periodic orbits, it gives a lower bound, using the Betty numbers. Okay, and well, already Arnold's conjecture was uh, what put uh, Floer in this business. But at the end of the day, probably he got discouraged because the proof of Arnold's conjecture is, is comes from the proof of that, that the most, that Floer homology is more homology. So it doesn't depend on the Hamiltonian as much. This must be like a point in which you have been working hard on a, on a thing and then you prove that it doesn't depend on the Hamiltonian, but of course, like you, you get Arnold's conjecture from, from this observation. So, okay, why singular? Here I wanted to see, so show you some pictures as I destroyed my former talk. So, uh, of pictures of me when I was, this is back in 2009 with Ana Rita Pires in Paris when we could travel. This is Victor Guillemin and this is Ana Canas that you know from Zurich, so I'm in Zurich today. And uh, Anna Canas had been working on folded symplectic manifolds. These are manifolds where the, the symplectic condition uh, fails, okay, on an hypersurface. And what happens is that 
omega n is no longer a volume, but it goes to zero on, on this either surface. And then also you have a condition that the pullback of omega is, uh, is of maximal rank. When you have this situation, you say you have a folded simplex manifold. And in a way, the, the, the word folded comes from the fact that if you study uh, the Sun theory, which is like the initial point of Anna Kanas in, in this story, then uh, you can interpret the sans, all the Delsan theory by folding the polytopes. That, uh, that's a good way to think of this. And this is Victor Gilleming with whom uh, Anarita and I started to work on a kind of dual object, which is what happens if you have a symplectic structure such that on an hypersurface, omega n explodes instead of going to zero. And this is what, what put uh, us to work on these B symplectic manifolds. And indeed, we had been working on B symplectic manifolds accidentally, initially thinking of Poisson, uh, of this as a Poisson object. Indeed, it's, uh, today I will not consider it as a Poisson object, but it is, I can think of as one of these symplectic forms as a bivector field, okay? Sometimes it's convenient to have that point of view. Today, I will not need it. I can think that I have a symplectic manifold, okay, away from an hypersurface. And uh, indeed, when we started to work with this, with Victor, uh, we worked on, on these objects from the, the perspective of Poisson geometry, as I was indeed in, indeed in, the, in this crowd of people, of Poisson geometry. And then one day, we realized that this had to do a lot with what Melrose had done. Melrose also from MIT, I'm living very close to Victor. Uh, and he had been working on the study on, the, um, on all the differential operators and manifolds with boundary. And well, he wrote a lot of books, in particular, a big, big book on the proof of Atiyah uh, on the index theorem on manifolds with boundary. And then he had, in order to do that, he had developed what he called the big calculus. And at the end of the day, what was happening is that he, Essentially, you could give a proof of the Atiya Patodi uh, Singer theorem, looking at the proof of Atiya Singer theorem, forgetting that you have this boundary and putting this kind of uh, condition of the boundary into the, the, the forms, in which you, instead of working with, different, with the RAM forms, you enlarge the class of forms with which you work. And this was a source of inspiration for us because Indeed, we had started to work with these objects from a Poisson perspective, but we can work uh, with these objects as indeed as, uh, as forms, okay, that extend around forms. And this is uh, the point of view I will adopt today. I have to say though, that these forms also appeared in the, in the problem of studied quantization, the formation quantization, manifolds with boundary. And this was done by Richard Nest and Boris Segan uh, back in the nineties. And, and then, uh, indeed, I was giving, when, when I started to work on this, uh, indeed, this was 2009, I started to also to, to have a, a tenure track position in, my, in the university where I am now, which is the Polytechnica. This was in 2009. And then I gave a talk about this in front of some colleagues. And then Amadeu del Sams, who is one in dynamical systems, told me, well, look, uh, these kind of objects appear also in celestial mechanics. Look, read these papers, blah, blah. And I realized they appear in regularization. So, so why singular? Well, sometimes you have to explain. Sometimes you don't have to explain why you do things. And one, two, three are like, like some sound reasons uh, to work on this. Also, these singularities appear in problems in free dynamics, in which I'm trying to work lately also. And the fourth reason is my favorite one. Why not? Why I wouldn't like to consider a singular symplectic manifold. So that's the setup, okay? And I'm going to put a couple of motivating examples. Uh, the example of the restricted three body problem, okay? That has appeared in this talk. So I, I consider the three problem, the three bodies, but I, I assume that they move in a plane. And I assume that uh, one of the bodies that has a negligible mass, which is the spacecraft, okay? And I assume that the other two follow the Kepler's law for the two-body problem. So this is what is called the circular uh, planar restricted three-body problem. And I'm not able to organize these words <laughs> always in the same way. Okay, so let's look at equations. We have seen this these days and several times, but let, let me refresh this. We have a potential. We have the, I'm going to assume that one of the, I, I, that I have the Earth and the Moon, but you can think that you have two planets, whatever. And, 
uh, this is the Hamiltonian of the system, okay? And uh, by considering, uh, well, in, in, in all this business, uh, one of the things that it's, uh, that, 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 that it's usually done is to consider a change to polar coordinates, that's a standard. And then McGehee considered uh, a regularization transformation, which is this change of variables. Okay, this regularization transformation is dividing by X. Okay, we know that this is going to introduce singularities and that's what happens. So what happens is that uh, you get a, a form that it's symplectic away from X equal to Z. People who have been working uh, with these uh, objects uh, usually escape singularities. So uh, people working in dynamical systems, many of them in my department, this is very nice, say, well, this form is symplectic uh, away from x equal to zero, I have enough. But the point is that what happens at, at x equal to zero, which is infinity, it's, it's important. Uh, you're going to see why. In particular, uh, one of the things I'm going to try to convince you today is that we can find infinite periodic orbits there. Okay, so the kind of objects I will work are of two, uh, uh, locally can be written in local coordinates uh, this way, the first one, would be a form that explodes, okay? Uh, and the second one would be a sort of dual. I can think of a dual and indeed the idea of duality will appear later, later because there is a way, in a way we can de-singularize these, these, these forms and uh, these forms, uh, which are the folded forms studied by Anacanas, okay? So of course, while you have these symplectic objects, you could also think that you have uh, a contact uh, objects appearing. How do you make them appear? Well, in the standard way, you take a Hamiltonian, you take a Liouville vector field transverse to it, and, and, you, and you look at the contact structure induced. So, uh, so that's a motivating example. So of course, if you start putting a regularization transformation like the one of Magihi, this contact structure will inherit some singularities. So the Weinstein conjecture, which is leading conjecture for uh, contact manifolds or Arnold conjecture thinking on, on these symplectic manifolds makes sense to think of them in terms of this singular symplectic manifold. This is our motivation. But, okay, uh, let, me, let me say two more words, okay? Uh, I want now to see how the singular, I mean, I want to describe some results that have already appeared. Uh, that what has, I mean, when I say regularization here, I talk about Magihi but the regularization that has appeared these days concerning the uh, planar circular three-body problem is the most regularization. So what I'm going to explain now is some for former results from Albers, Paterne, uh, Van Court, and Fraunfelder. Uh, I think I don't forget anyone. Uh, concerning the topology of the restricted, uh, the contact topology of the restricted three-body problem. And their point of view is that uh, I take the former Hamiltonian that I had here, and I make it, which is still time dependent. And if I write my, my system in rotating coordinates, the Hamiltonian becomes time independent, okay? Then the critical points of the Hamiltonian are the Lagrange points, and these are well known. And the results they have concern uh, indeed the level set of the first Lagrange uh, point. So, uh, when we study periodic orbits of this problem, like here, the pro we have like two crowds of people that sometimes don't talk to each other. People work on, working in celestial mechanics uh, usually use perturbative methods um, to, to try to find periodic orbits. And then people who work in contact domain. And it's extremely hard to communicate because, because the language is different. Like Cedric and I like uh, know this, like we are some, somehow in the intersection. We try to be in the intersection. So as I said, contact geometry appears naturally when we have this transverse Liouville vector field. And one of the things they did is to find like uh, for level sets below the first Lagrange point, they found a Liou the Liouville vector field, which is transverse to the, to the level set of the Hamiltonian, okay? They take the level set of the Hamiltonian of the earth, sorry. And I have to move this thing here, okay, right. And uh, they consider the level set. So the level set has three connected components uh, and E is the one the, the level as E, the one of the earth. Okay. And then what they prove is that this is a contact manifold, that it's a tight contact manifold. And uh, well, if you want to apply Weinstein conjecture in dimension three, you need uh, compactness. Okay. 
and via Mosa regularization, they compactify this uh, contact to the projective space, okay? And then therefore, as an application of Einstein conjecture, they get for any value below the first Lagrange point, they admit uh, that the level set admits at least one closed orbit with energies. That's the result. And here there are some questions. And indeed, this is Cedric. This is a picture of Cedric in 2017. 17, yeah, I think. We were both in Paris. He's he's sitting there in a call normal. This was, well, after one year, he started the, the, the thesis. And the first thing I told him is like, you have to learn everything that these people have been doing. And let's try to see how singularities play a role. This was a difficult, difficult question. So the questions that Cedric is thinking of in this picture is, where are those periodic orbits? And uh, are they on the collision set? Can we keep track of the singularity? And this is how we start to work on, on these objects. Of course, one thing you, you have, like the, the, the theory of PM symplectic manifolds is something that, uh, that I have been working on with Victor in the last uh, years quite a lot, but the theory, the contact counterpart was not explored. This is what Cedric did in his thesis. And you can ask all kinds of questions. Today, I'm just going to concentrate on the ones concerning periodic orbits. Another example, a uh, natural example from singular uh, contact uh, structures appears when we look at Euler flows, okay? Euler flows, uh, well, this would be an example from fluid dynamics. This is the, the standard equations of Euler. These are Euler equations uh, written in the standard language. So thinking of Euler equations in R3, okay? When I give a talk about this in front of uh, my colleague uh, Cabret, he says, of course, but this is always happens in R3. I said, no, this happens on any Riemannian manifold. And he looks at me like uh, I came from another planet. Maybe I come from another planet, I don't know. But we can generalize those, uh, those examples to any dimension and we can generalize those, uh, those equations, Euler equations to any, to any Riemannian structure, okay? And uh, indeed, I, I was not thinking of these problems. Uh, I, I ended up looking at this because I have a friend, uh, Daniel Peralta Sala, who works with these objects. And lately I work with friends only. I, I, you have an aging which you start just working with friends. And then I told him, okay, let's work together on something. Let's find something to work on. And then we realized about a funny thing. Well, first, first of all, he had been working on stationary solutions of these equations. Among the stationary solutions, uh, the Beltrami fields are the one that satisfy these two conditions here. These conditions make sense that the divergence and curl, this makes sense for any uh, metric, Riemannian metric that you put, not only the standard one, and they make sense in, in higher dimensions, okay? And then um, if you look at these, the solutions of these two equations, these are the uh, Beltrami fields satisfy these two equations, and it's a stationary solution with constant Bernoulli function. The Bernoulli function is a function that you cook up from the pressure of your system, okay? And, and the metric. Of course, these equations, as I say, are the cheap equations, right? You have implicit incompressible fluid flow. If you work with the visit uh, case, you are Navier Stokes, you are working on things that can give you a lot of money, but we are working on the cheap version, like the Euler equations, which if you solve, you don't you don't solve any conjecture on the, on any list. So, but whatever, it's fun to work with them. And one uh, thing which makes very different Euler equations from Navier-Stokes is is the fact that Euler equations uh, have a lot of geometry. And let me show you just a simple example. If I take x a solution to Euler equations and I contract with the metric that I have that can be the standard metric. Okay, so here I, I have a one form, and to this I have a volume form. Okay. Uh, then if I convert, if I introduce uh, this dual uh, language, then the equations can be written in this way. These two equations, the stationary equations can be written in this way, which, okay, as a geometer, this look much more attractive than these equations here, right? So uh, now the natural question is, well, this form, this is a one form, is it a contact form? And the answer is yes, indeed. This was indeed, there, there was some work of Victor Ginsburg and, and, uh, and Boris Kessin working on these on this, uh, kind of objects, but in, in even dimensions. So they really didn't prove this. The proof was really given by, by Ender and Greist, 
okay, who prove that this alpha is contact. And indeed, they prove that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Beltrami vector fields and contact structures, okay. Uh, they did this in dimension three, but this works in, in any dimensions. It's the same proof, okay. So this is indeed a very powerful tool because uh, it relates to different worlds, like Beltrami fields to contact structures, and indeed also re relates to different ways to do analysis on this manifold, which is going to be very important for us. And indeed, where the singularities appear in this picture, in this correspondence, well, I mean, this is the proof that it's uh, that it's contact. This could be an exercise for the program session. I, I'm going to skip it. Uh, there are one minute for the discussion. So, well, uh, the, the structures, the singularities come in when we consider manifolds with boundary, or we, when we consider this uh, flow on, on some, I mean, we consider these Euler equations and we consider this fluid on, on moving on manifolds with boundary, okay? Or say we really consider the movement and we put a barrier there, and this barrier in that is going to become the singularity. And, and it's quite interesting to have this example in mind because some of the conjectures uh, are very useful to think of them from the point of view of fluid dynamics. Okay, so essentially we have a, a kind of magic mirror, okay, that tells you how to pass from contact geometry to these, uh, to these, um, Beltrami uh, flows, okay? Beltrami flows and contact structures are related. So a red vector fields, the red vector field of the contact structure. So the correspondence is just the red vector field of the constant uh, contact structure is just, uh, you know, reparameterization, okay? Of the, of the Beltrami field. So that's the correspondence. You just need to reparameterize and the reparameterization, reparameterization is given by the norm of the, of the vector field. Okay, so indeed this uh, already brought to Edna and Bryce. Uh, Edna and Bryce have some, some papers that I have been reading with a lot of attention because they, they give you an application of vibes and conjecture. Okay, so uh, in their case, you don't have singularities and then you apply vibes and conjecture and they prove existence of periodic orbits for Beltrami. Clean, just application of vibes and conjecture. And this, this way to apply, the, to apply the picture is, you know something in contact geometry and you apply it to fluid dynamics. You could also think to, to apply, uh, to look at the mirror in the other way. Do you know you have a result in fluid dynamics? Can you apply it in contact geometry? And an example of that is, uh, this is something we did with uh, Cedric and Daniel Peralta Salas, uh, which is to apply some result of Uhlenbeck. So we need the, the analysis that Beltrami vector fields carries with it. So we applied some Ulenbeck genericity properties of the Laplacian to prove indeed existence of singular periodic orbits. So indeed we applied the techniques of Ulenbeck to prove the singular, what we call the singular Weinstein conjecture, which is to prove indeed the existence not only of periodic orbits on a singular manifold, but also of the singular periodic orbits of this Evil bridge in Germany. Okay, so what, what I need to do is a little, to introduce a little bit of language. Uh, Symplectic and contact geometry we know, and now what I, I'm going to do is to introduce the singularities. For this, I need to do a graffiti here. I introduce a B. And B comes from boundary and comes from this uh, work done by Matteo Melrose. Uh, by, sorry, by Melrose, well, also Matteo, but Melrose was the first one, which is all the developing, all the theory of big calculus. Okay, so now I need to zoom out. And okay, if this was, we were uh, in normal times, we would be now in Zurich. Well, this is a nice picture, which doesn't look like it's uh, winter. I don't know. But well, let me dream that I'm in Zurich and that I can zoom out and look and through the window of my hotel because uh, Jagna would have put out all of us in a beautiful hotel. Okay. So then I would be looking uh, here and I would be having a bright uh, mathematical ideas. Okay, so let me introduce you. We need, I need to zoom a bit out. So introduce a bit of language to go on with this floor uh, complex of singular symplectic manifolds. I, I need to introduce a little bit of language. I need to explain you how formally I can enlarge uh, the, the, the forms I work with. Because I could say, ah, okay, you take a form and, you, and the form has a pole, live with it. 
Okay, well, this is what a physicist could do, but we are mathematicians, so we have to find a very sophisticated way of telling the, the truth. Okay, so that's what we do. I'm going to define what is a singular form, and in order to do this, I consider my manifold and I take a, an hypersurface of this manifold and I take the vector fields that are tangent to the hypersurface. Okay, of course, if I take a random vector field of my manifold and I, and I have an hypersurface, this vector field could cross the hypersurface, could do many things. But the condition that the vector field is tangent to this hypersurface is a, is a restriction, okay? So the question is, do I have a vector bundle such that these vector fields are sections of the vector bundle? And so in a way, with this, I'm producing locally, okay, these vector fields. And the answer of this is given indeed by a result of Serre, or if you want by Swan, if you think in the different in the in terms of differential manifolds, not analytic manifolds, in which you, it tells you that if you have a finitely dimensional, uh, so if you if you consider if locally you can find a finite number of generators, then you, such a a vector bundle exists. Okay. And this vector bundle is a rank, it's a rank, uh, it has the same rank as the tangent bundle, but it's not, let me say it before anyone else, it's not isomorphic to the tangent bundle. Okay? It's not isomorphic to, sometimes it's isomorphic to the tangent bundle, sometimes it's not. And Joaquin Bruges knows a lot about this. Like he's here. So later on in the discussion, we can, you can ask him questions. <laughs> okay. We have, uh, he has cooked out all kinds of counterexamples. And so it's very interesting to think of this. So essentially what I'm going to do, you, you are already thinking of this, is to uh, define uh, differential forms, okay, the RAM forms, as just sections of the standard cotangent bundle or exterior products of the cotangent bundle. Okay, what I do is to change this cotangent bundle by the dual of this B tangent model of Belrose. This is the B cotangent model, which I define by duality simply, okay? At every point, this is a vector space, so I define by duality, okay? And then, okay, sections of this uh, exterior product of these uh, cotangent bundles are going to be B forms. Once I have this, life is easy because then I can extend, indeed, I can extend the differential, the Durham differential, to these uh, forms. That's easy because in it I have an easy way to express these forms, okay, in terms of the pole. In a way, what this is doing for you is to put the singularities to declare the dx over x as a legal differential form. That's what we do. Okay, so in particular, what's going to be a bisymplectic form? If you think in this language, which is the most appropriate language, this is not the language you started to work with, uh, then a B symplectic form is just going to be a closed down degenerate form, B form of degree two. So uh, it's the same definition as symplectic form, okay, but on a different complex. So instead of uh, using the RAM complex, we use the B complex. The B complex indeed is an extension of the, the RAM complex. And indeed, you can compute very easily the cohomology, the, what is called the B cohomology, in terms of the RAM cohomology. There is a formula. And what's nice, is that as a Poisson manifold, this is indeed Poisson cohomology, okay? So if you are a fan of Poisson cohomology, this is finite dimensional, this is quite a miracle. Okay, so we discovered this quite late in the game uh, with Victor, but once we discover this, we say, okay, let's play symplectic geometry, we apply the Arbuth theorem, then you can prove lots of things. You can prove a B Arbuth theorem, which you could also prove from a perspective Poisson geometry. You can prove uh, semi-local forms. You can prove whatever you want, action angle coordinates, KAM. You can do many things. Indeed, it's, it's a bit more complicated than what I'm saying now, but let's say this was a aha moment, the moment in which we realized that we could think of these objects indeed as uh, B symplectic forms. Okay. In the same way, in B contact forms, which as an example, we have this uh, both the, the restriction and the restricted three body problem, which I will come back, or these uh, Beltrami fields on manifold switch boundary. Okay. Uh, then, if I look at uh, one forms uh, that satisfy the condition of being contact, which is this condition here, then this will be B contact forms. And I can become totally crazy. I can replace this band, this, this B cotangent bundle by any Lie algebra. Okay? This is not the right day to do this, so I will not do it. 
but Ness and Sigan already mentioned this and it's quite entertaining. Now, a natural question is you have created your own creature, which is VM symplectic manifolds. You are proving quite similar results. Like we, we could prove, like, you know, a kind of the sand result. It's not exactly like the standard one because you have always an invariant that it's Poisson that looks from the modular vector field, which is quite known in, in Poisson business. But essentially, you are doing a little bit like symplectic geometry. So a natural question late in the game, this was in back in 2015, is like uh, talking one day to Victor Guillem in, in Porto. What are we doing? Maybe we are working with the same objects. How, how different are these objects? So we have the box of BM symplectic manifolds, the box of symplectic manifolds, and the box of folded symplectic manifolds. Can we compare them? Because of course you could prove Darbu theorem, Dalsan, our action angle coordinates for all of them. Uh, are they the same? Let's look at examples. Of course, an orientable surface, for instance, is everything you want. But if I go to CP2, for instance, this is not a bisymplectic manifold, but it's folded and it's symplectic. It's folded because it's dimension four, and this is thanks to a theorem of Arakanas da Silva. And S4 is a very nice example. We know it's not symplectic. We know it's not bisymplectic, and the proof is the same, uh, replacing the cohomology proof by the B cohomology. So you take the, the B form and you say, well, the B form defines a non-vanishing class in H2. Therefore, uh, S4 cannot be missing. But it's folded symplectic because it's compact four-dimensional and Anakanas proved this. Because Anakanas proved a more general a more general result, but I don't want to enter this. So indeed, uh, another aha moment was when we discovered that you can't really de-singularize those. The singularization indeed looks better than what it has been in practice but it looks like a magic wand, uh, which you can take your manifold and boom, I de-singularize this. I have a BM symplectic manifold. I don't like BM symplectic manifolds. I de-singularize this. And then I either get a family of symplectic forms that converge in the way you like, or I get folded symplectic forms. So this is telling you that via the singularization, you can relate what you are doing to one of these two worlds. Indeed, there is, a bit of simplification because this arrow is not uh, in a, for two forms, is not, you cannot reverse it, okay? Uh, that's why I say in particular, this allows you to understand a lot of topological constraints because out of the sudden many people were studying the topological constraints. This gives you, uh, this puts a lot of order, but in particular, it tells you that the converse is not true because S4 is folded symplectic, but it's not B symplectic. So essentially that was an aha moment and this is, allows us to understand. And of course, we are going to try to use the singularization theorem to work our floor business, okay? So this is why I'm introducing it. Another general picture, okay, if I was there in Zurich, Jagna, today is the day of the official dinner, Jagna would take me to a very nice, would take all of us to a very nice restaurant, and we were right there in front of the restaurant. But we are not on the restaurant, so here I am showing you a picture of Zurich by night. Take your coat, okay? So another picture would be uh, to look at, and that's the, the dual picture that I'm, I'm not going to get it, but we need it for the proofs, okay? I'm going to hide this for you, but I have to tell you that uh, we started to work on B symplectic manifolds or B Poisson manifolds, thinking of Poisson, ah, I should uh, talk about my vector fields. I don't want to talk about the vector fields. And, the, the, the language that, let's say, there is a common language between this B Poisson and contact, which is Jac the one of Jacobi manifolds. And, and Jac the Jacobi business is like quite, to tell you the truth, cumbersome. I mean, computations are terrible, but sometimes you need to go into that, uh, just uh, to say this. And one of the things we will need is that if you have a symplectic manifold, and this is something that, that Urs is going, to re it's going to remind him of something. If I have uh, one of these B-symplectic manifolds, there is an induced structure on the critical set itself. And in, in order to look at this uh, induced structure, I can think of this in the Poisson way, or I can work uh, with some particular decomposition. Indeed, I have a co-symplectic structure induced on the boundary. Urs, a uh, long time ago, also in 2009, no, 2003, 
when we were all young in 2003, he had been working on uh, symplectic manifolds, which had a boundary of, of contact type. Okay. And okay, the contact type would be the generic, if you think about this condition of the Liouville vector field, or of being a symplectic vector field transverse to the boundary, or being a Liouville vector field, indeed, I would say that Urs has been working with the, indeed, the generic case. If you think in general, this as a, as a Levy vector field, as a Levy structure, then the, what would be remaining uh, to work with would be the case of the cos symplectic manifolds. And the, the structure, the, the fact that it's a cos symplectic structure is very easy to see uh, from this perspective of uh, Poisson geometry. You can also see it with this B symplectic, never mind. I will use this at the last slide of my talk. No, at the, not the last one, but the previous to the last one. Okay, I have like 20 minutes. I was like, I mean, it's like 27, don't panic. I will skip some of the things. Okay, let me say that when we started, so okay. So now we want to prove, we, we, are, we want to prove two things. We want to prove the Bison conjecture in this uh, setup, okay? And the Arnold conjecture, okay? For the Bison conjecture, we have so far escaped the floor business, but for the Arnold conjecture, we need the floor business. And indeed, inspiration of how to define the floor comes from a proof of the Bayesian conjecture. So I need to explain this. One of the things we did with Cedric, uh, we did some, some errors in the past, even false proofs, many false proofs, but one of the proofs which I think is not false is the fact that we proved that if you have a contact manifold and BM is that you have this order M, okay? You have a BM manifold, then on the critical set, you have infinite periodic orbits. This is a little bit connected to this idea of the restricted free body problem. Though the problem there is that this only apply to a critical hypersurface that it's compact. So in that case, I need to do a different computation. And this comes very easily from an observation is that the red vector field it is Hamiltonian. And if you are working on three dimensional manifolds then it's, it's Hamiltonian, dimension two, blah, 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 blah. You check that it's not constant, blah, 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 blah. Therefore you have a foliation by circles. You have as much as more, than, more circles than the ones that you need. And indeed, of course, we can construct examples where you don't have periodic orbits away from Z, okay? And let me point out the second example, okay? Have example on S3, on T3. And on T3, this example is interesting because you don't have periodic orbits, but you have singular periodic orbits. This example is interesting because it has a lot of symmetry. And indeed, it corresponds, this red vector field is I, if I use the mirror between contact and Beltrami, this corresponds to a famous vector field for fluid dynamics, which is the ABC flow. The only problem is that here the A is a zero. So it's the ABC flow with A equal to zero. And this indeed for those kind of uh, contact manifolds, we can always prove that there exists a singular orbit. And we do this uh, thanks to Karen Ullenme. Okay. So let me go back to the example of the restricted three body problem. Uh, these computations I showed them before. Okay. Then, okay, one thing uh, that we were doing with Cedric is, okay, let's work uh, the three, the let's, let's work uh, so, okay, Cedric, let's try to prove that there exist infinite periodic orbits. Okay, it's not compact, but it, it cannot be that difficult. Okay, the, this is something we did during the, the lockdown because the PhD student cannot escape. Okay, you have a PhD student during the lockdown and he cannot escape. Okay, so <laughs> Cedric couldn't escape. And then uh, we proved, like in this case, the computation was explicit. The critical set is a cylinder but we proved that there exists on, on this critical set, which corresponds to the set at infinity, there exists an infinite number of periodic orbits. And this result is new for people working in celestial mechanics. That's one of the things we did. And then here comes the general approach. The general approach is, ha, huh, I have the magic wand of the singularization, okay? Uh, Cedric, this will work. Indeed, this was the first attempt to prove Weinstein conjecture. Let's apply to the singularization, you apply Weinstein conjecture, and you go home. Of course, this will only apply while well, the singularization business, I explained you the, the, the even dimension, the, the case of symplectic manifolds, but it works very well for contact manifolds. This is something that Cedric did in his thesis. And then, well, one, one of the ideas of the singularization is, pop, you do it in the contact case, and you go home. What is the problem of this idea? Well, the problem of this idea is that 
uh, well, the dependence of the action functional, you have a family of, of uh, contact structure, so you get a family of orbits, but there's no, there's no guarantee they will converge. And indeed, uh, essentially, you can have three kinds of orbits. If the orbits are Z, we already proved you have infinite periodic orbits. If the orbits are away from Z, this is going to work. Mm, you can make it work. Let me call it like, like this. But if it cross, what, what's going to happen? Can you have this type three orbit? This would be one of the singular orbits. Okay. One of the things you can do is uh, try to copy. This is what I was saying. Like I can uh, address the type one orbits. If if you have an over twisted manifold, okay, then Hoffer proved using simplectization that there exists a periodic orbit. One thing we did is to copy this idea in the B case, okay? And indeed this idea works well, not only for B contact, it works well for any non-compact uh, contact manifold, okay? That has some condition that is required. We require a condition of R invariance. Essentially the R invariance condition is the condition is if you get close to the boundary, poof, you get, there is some invariance that can push you back inside, okay, inside the compact part of the manifold. So indeed, you are replacing the, the lack of compactness by this invariance. This is something we did, okay. We prove that, well, you can have at least a periodic orbit, and indeed, if the orbit is very close, is, is the orbit is close to the boundary, so you can apply this R invariance, you're going to have a family of periodic. What did, how did we do the proof? Well, we looked at the proof of Hoffer, and essentially the, 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 the idea is, is to use this R invariance to put this, uh, okay, this is the, I'm going very quickly, this is the overtwisted, uh, this, uh, this is the Bishop family, okay? Then, well, the, the proof of Hoffer is, oh, if there is a finite uh, plane, then you're going to have a periodic orbit. Then what you need to see, you need to make sure that this, uh, this finite plane is not going to approach this area. If you approach the gray area, then you apply the invariance and you push it inside. This is essentially the proof. It's, it's a proof by pushing inside the proof of, of Hoffer. Okay. Indeed, and, and that's a good context uh, to try to do the floor business, okay? Uh, because it's essentially replaces the, or, or to do floor for non-compact, when you have these R invariants. Uh, indeed, this works. This is what I say here. This works for an, a contact manifold that has an over twisted disk. Okay. And well, still the question of can you have these singular orbits? And now I have like 10 minutes. I really want to get to the floor point. I look at Jagna. Jagna wants to know about the floor. I know this. So I'm going to go very quickly over this. I'm going to say that the, the, a singular periodic orbit, the one that you see in this bridge, okay, it's going to see an orbit. Indeed, essentially in, in the language of foliation, it's not one orbit, it's four orbits, but I take the closure. Okay, so it's an orbit where the red vector field is going to vanish. Okay, and here it's in dimension three. I'm in dimension three at this moment, okay. And this has a connection to what in celestial mechanics is called escape orbits, because if you are in a tiny neighborhood of your, of your, if you are on this aerial bridge, okay, and you are very close to the water, okay, it's like very foggy, so you don't see whatever is out there. So you don't know if this orbit is going to go back or it's going to leave. Escape orbit is that it leaves. So this took uh, Cedric and I into an excursion, an interesting excursion which we did through the magic mirror again. We needed the magic mirror. We needed to use Beltrami fields. So, because we had our friend Daniel, we called him like, let's try to do this together. And indeed using a formal result that we have with Robert, uh, the one I explained that on manifolds with boundary, you have a B manifold. Then uh, I had my friend uh, Daniel, I had uh, Cedric and we needed, it was time for Superman or Superwoman. I, cho I chose the Superwoman. So then uh, Karen Urenbeck had proved that if you have an Eigen function of the Laplacian, this is generically Morse. What is the relation of the Eigen function of the Laplacian? The relation is that this red vector field that is tangent to the critical set through the window, 
okay? It's going to become, if you look at the at this Hamiltonian function and you look it through the through this magic mirror, this Hamiltonian function associated to the revector field, because I said the revector field tangent to set is Hamiltonian, this function indeed is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian associated to the metric that gives you the correspondence. I'm not giving a lot of detail here. So that's the magic. And that, that uh, let us prove that, uh, well, this you can do when the Laplacian, when you can work with the Laplacian, okay? And you can work with the Laplacian if you have uh, the metric that you have is uh, split. This metric is a split. Uh, to, to do this in a neighborhood of that is easy, but to do it globally is difficult. But one thing we could do is to prove, thanks to this, the existence of these escape orbits. But now the question is, did you really prove the singular rights and conjecture? Which is, do you have these singular orbits? We need to see if these orbits go back. Essentially, we have a garden of orbits. Some orbits uh, jump from one connected component to the other. Some come to the same connected component, and some of them indeed are generalized orbits, like the oscillating orbits in celestial mechanics. So one thing we proved is that in the in the supersymmetric case, in the case in which you have this symmetry that appears already in this generalization of the theorem of Hoffer, uh, so we assume that there exists that the vector field, which is vertical perpendicular to the critical set, which indeed has a name, it's the normal vector field in symplectic geometry. We assume that this defines a global symmetry. This is a strong assumption, as so strong as you can only have a flat T3. Okay, but it's good because it includes okay the uh, ABC flows. So it's Okay, it's a T3, but it's significant because it's the ABCK. So it's interesting from fluid dynamics. So for them, we could prove that there exists a singular uh, periodic orbit. And we did this proof very recently. You can find it on the archive. And in, 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 in it is a starting from the escape orbit and being able to see that one of them has to go back. So we really proved the singular lines and conjecture and we did it with the force of, of the analysis. I don't know if we can prove it with uh, with floor theory, of course. One question I leave this for the for eight. Uh, what about the restricted three body problem? Can you apply these Laplace techniques? We were not able to do this, and this picture reminds us that we are not Superman. We are Superman for two or three minutes, and then we look ourselves in the mirror, and we couldn't prove it yet. And now I know that Jagna is thinking, Eva. It's five minutes to the end of the talk. Will you please compute some floor homology? So, right? This is my telepathic moment. So, okay, there we go. <laughs> so we have like, the, the like, like we have like two ideas. Like the first idea is like very beautiful, and but it's very difficult, which is, is the idea of Rabinovich, okay? Replacing, so the loop space is the space of smooth maps from S1 to your manifold. Now, what I want to do is to find, of course, the Rabinovich tells me the singular points of the action functional. If you are contact, it's going to be this one. If you are symplectic, it's going to be this one. It's going to give you periodic orbits. But I want to see this, I want to see this periodic orbit. And what well, the first thing to, to do is to understand the loop space on to generalize the notion of loop space to include the singularities, okay? Has this been studied a little bit? The topology of these manifolds has been studied, but not the differential part. Indeed, I have too many PhD students, but I want to take a PhD student who starts this point. I think this is a very interesting point, but it's challenging, it's difficult, but it's very interesting. That's, that's the first approach, okay? Indeed, that's an approach that with, with Joachim, who is here, we are doing it by approximation. Of course, you can think, well, instead of doing it, defining, okay, the differential topology, try to find a collection of uh, pseudomorphic curves that converge to this critical set. That's, that's a, an approach. We didn't start thinking very deeply on this yet, but this is something that we want to do with Joachim. But the easier path is like, okay, we now know what happens with this, uh, at least in the contact case, what happens when you have these invariants? And we realize that the invariance is very convenient to tackle the non-compact situation. And this gives us some inspiration, what I'm going to explain now, 
his joint work with uh, Joachim, who is here, you know that Joachim looks quite a lot like Floer. So I think his future in Floer theory is guaranteed because his picture looks quite a lot, and, and Cedric. And it's inspired by the work of Urs and, and, and Felix, who uh, considered the symplectic uh, manifolds with boundary of contact type. And now what we consider is the boundary of cosymplectic type, essentially. But uh, our conditions are the following. Of course, we are going to assume that pi 2 equals 0 and that certain class is 0, though they assume a weaker condition than this. We are going to assume like a B condition, so we don't have to think, and then maybe we can refine them. And then, uh, then you, we are going to assume that we have this kind of R invariance perpendicular. Okay. And that's the third condition. It's a condition that works uh, well. That, okay, let me tell you the truth that in dimension two, we cannot make it work. But in higher dimensions, we think we can make it work. But we still don't know. This is work that we wrote, wrote down in the, on Monday. We have a file where we, the three of us work and we wrote that this on Monday, we were discussing all the morning, it was very productive. So one thing we do is to assume that we take a Hamiltonian. So uh, comparing this to the work of Federica and Jagna and, and collaborators and all your collaborators that you have many on this topic of tentacular. So our tentacular Hamiltonians indeed, or, or eligible Hamiltonians or admissible Hamiltonians are going to be the ones that don't have periodic orbits in a neighborhood of Z. So in a way, this is very restrictive. We are asking, we are asking that the dream of Poincaré is somehow too, true, that you have a very split dynamics. Uh, so this is not totally general. Uh, but for this, we could prove okay, that if we have a B symplectic manifold, which is non-compact and satisfies this condition, then we look, okay, we what we what we did is to look at the recipe of Floer, right? And try to see, to tick if everything works. If we look at the moduli space of Floer, uh, this is the equation, uh, Floer equation, okay? Of, uh, so solutions of Floer equation satisfy these ones, and we need to take the ones, okay? We take the moduli space of the ones that have finite energy. We need to provide that this is compact, indeed. We were able to do this, and the lemma, and the key lemma, we need to assume, and that's a big assumption. Indeed, this cannot happen in dimension two. We need to 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 think a little bit uh, more. We know what this does cannot happen in dimension two, and because of the example of the ABC flows, with this can happen in dimension four. Uh, that if you have uh, that the symplectic form, that the the complex structure, and that the Hamiltonian R invariant, X invariant, where X is this uh, symplectic vector field perpendicular to the boundary, then the solutions of the Flora equation are also invariant. So we can play the same trick. All the trick we are doing is that to guarantee that the equations cannot be very close to the boundary, so we can always push them back to the compact uh, part of the manifold. This is a little bit the idea. And I cannot finish, like it's like my last minute, let me finish my last minute with a conjecture, which is the Bond conjecture. Bond from, from Bruges, Oms, and Miranda, which is that what we want to do indeed is first of all this is to construct the floor homology of the complement of Z, which is under the constraints, under the strong constraints, okay, that you have this kind of, uh, of B-symplectic manifold with total symmetry. Okay, if you don't have this symmetry, this doesn't work. Okay, and then under these conditions, we, we can complete, and, and the conditions that we are doing, the third condition is very dynamical to impose that you don't have these periodic orbits. Indeed, in dimension two, this cannot have, happen if you have this uh, H invariant. Okay, it's very easy to prove. Well, it's very easy to prove. We realized yesterday. Okay, and uh, but you can have this in, in higher dimensions. And then, uh, because the conditions are quite ad hoc to have a kind of split dynamics, then the floor homology of the manifold, of the initial B manifold, uh, is going to be given by a recipe, which is the floor homology of the manifold and the standard homology of Z. And this recipe comes from the fact that we are going, we assume we are going to be able to prove some kind of isomorphism with the standard homology, okay? 
yeah, this would should uh, yield us to some Arnold conjecture in this uh, setup. And the inspiration, of course, then comes from the Matteo Melrose uh, formula. This was our first approach it did with uh, Joachim, but it doesn't work in general. In general, it's uh, we uh, initially with Joachim, we wanted to define the flow homology in general and to prove that it's going to be the it's going to, for B symplectic manifold should be the big homology. But we realized this was too restrictive. This should be true in the case in which you have this invariance condition. And okay, now another telepathical moment with Changna is okay. It's time, and I promise you that I will compute fluoromology of more general v symplectic manifolds. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Eva, for your great talk. Let's uh, give Eva uh, a round of applause. Thank you for very, very uh, cool telepathic uh, uh, connections and uh, the knowledge that you were able to, to um, convey. Unfortunately, we are kind of uh, are a little bit short of time now, <laughs> but yeah. uh, we will discuss much more in depth and shower you with questions uh, in our discussion session, which is going to be 